You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by CBOE Live Vol. CBOE Live Vol is the leader in equity and index options trading technology, providing professional and retail traders with the most sophisticated options risk analysis, compliance, and trading tools. CBOE Live Vol offers a broad spectrum of advanced trading technology, including the Live Vol X, next generation execution platform and live vol pro the new standard in options trading front ends visit livevol.com for a 15-day free trial today and by russell investments the home of russell indexes which calculates approximately 700,000 benchmarks daily covering 98 percent of the investable market globally including more than 80 countries and more than 10,000 securities approximately 4.1 trillion dollars in assets are benchmarked to russell indexes for more information on russell indexes and rvx please visit russell.com slash indexes and now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from a little thing we like to call around here, the Options Insider radio network quite a few shows on the network including volatility views the easiest way to get all of them the mothership the flagship the options insider.com they're right there scrolling along the right hand side or just subscribe to our full network the options insider radio network in any podcast provider of choice itunes tune in stitcher so if you want the full kit and caboodle the full fire hose all the shows the daily news show you know twifo option block ball views visors option all that fun stuff uh, you get it all via the network so subscribe there wherever you get your favorite program. So, of course, you can always stream it live from our site as well. It's all available there. So whatever makes you happy, including you can always grab our mobile app available for iOS, Android, and the ever-popular Fire OS. And, of course, since it's Volviews, you can always join us live as well every Friday, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, via Mixler, M-I-X-L-R. We tweet out the link. We Facebook the link. We stock twit the link so you guys can see it. Once you see it once, just grab it. It doesn't change. And you can use it whenever the, uh, whenever the mood strikes you to join us live. And you, too, can see how the sausage is made live. Sometimes it's not a pretty picture, but it's always worth, uh, it's always worth the journey at the end of the day, I assure you. And speaking of journeys, we do love to hear from you guys. We have people joining us on journeys. We'll get to them in a little bit. Uh, we do love to hear from you guys as well. So hit us up with those questions, those comments, whether it's live, whether it's via the app, whether it's via social media or email, however you reach out to us. We do love to hear from you guys. See what you're thinking about the world of volatility, what is going on. Uh, in your brains. We love to pick your brains as well. Not just our guests, but you guys, uh, the listeners. And joining me on the old program today, let's see who we got. We got the usual crew starting off with, uh, I don't know where anybody is, so let's just go in order as I pop up on my screen. Starting off with the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian, beaming in from somewhere. Perhaps it's the World HQ of Option Pit and Carmen Line here in downtown Chicago. Maybe he's in the satellite office out there in the suburbs. Maybe he's somewhere else entirely. Let's find out, Mr. Greasy Meatball. Welcome back to the Volatility Views program. And where the heck are you today? I'm in beautiful Rochester Hills, Michigan, enjoying the lovely uh, pure Michigan weather here. It's, uh, it's spring break, so wh where else would you go but 
the suburbs of Detroit. <laughs> I would not have guessed Rochester Hills, Michigan. That wasn't low on my uh, on my totem pole there. I'll, I'll have to I'll have to admit that. But there we go. A surprise. That's why I say I never know where anybody is. And speaking of not knowing where he is, I, I, this guy is hither and yon. I believe he's doing uh, the CBOE Bats World Tour, at least the domestic world tour. He was in uh, the uh, the former Bats HQ or some offices down there in uh, near the Kansas City area. Now I believe. I think he might be in the New York area. We'll have to check in and see. He is Mr. Russell Rhodes, the director of education slash uh, whatever the heck they're calling him over there these days, over there at the CBOE. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the Vol Views program. Where are you beaming in from today, sir? I'm in lower Manhattan with a beautiful, well, it's a crappy day, but normally you have a beautiful view from the CBOE BATS offices of uh, the Staten Island Ferry Building and the uh, the uh, Statue of Liberty, which I can barely make out on the horizon because the weather that was in Chicago yesterday and probably in Michigan where Mark Sebastian is last night is now in New York. It's a disgusting day in New York. There we go. Disgusting days in New York. Not not that bad. A little cold. A little chilly here in Chicago. Who knows what the heck it is in the suburbs of Detroit. With our weather report out of the way, let's get right into it. Let's get into the volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the volatility review. All right, I'm liking what I'm seeing here. Welcome to the Volatility Review. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we, uh, we take break down the week that was and indeed still is as things are going right now. I'm liking what I'm seeing here in the old VIX cash. It is trending right towards my 12 half prediction, I believe. What was I, 12 half or 12.55, somewhere in that range, 12 half last week. So there we go, 12.35 as we're sitting right now, listeners. So nice little boost to the VIX cash and is getting right in my wheelhouse. Of course, we have a full show to go, and we all know anything could happen. They could charge Hillary Clinton again. Something else crazy could happen uh, in the interim of this hour, and all hell could break loose. But right now, looking pretty good, so I'm happy with that. you got to take your victories, even the small ones, where you can get them. And as, for, as far as the broad, uh, the broad market is concerned, a bit of a uh, kind of a, a quiet end to the week, shall we say. Most of the major uh, indices are pretty much unched as we move into the middle of the session here today, uh, S&P pretty much unched, uh, the Dow and the NASDAQ pretty much unched as well, slightly up or down either direction. Not a heck of a lot to really write home about. Like I said, VIX Cash getting a nice little pop into yield weekend up nearly a handle, about 0.8. So uh, a nice little inhale there for good old VIX Cash. Has been an interesting week We'll parse all those di little nuggets in a little bit when we get to the different segments for the futures and the options and all the other fun stuff. But before we do that, let's check in with my cohorts, my partners in crime who are scattered hither and yon. Let's start, let's start in the suburbs of Detroit. Uh, Mr. Greasy Meatball, what caught your eye in this week's volatility action, sir? Well, it was a weird week. We started off with kind of the high for the year, I think, when uh, VIX was well over 14. And then within an hour, completely fizzled, just absolutely just sank. Volatility did stayed that way until today. And now here we are as there is some just, you know, people are worried. I think it's Trump stuff that's running up volatility. But uh, the VIX is now up almost a, a point on almost nothing happening. So markets are nervous about something. Uh, it could be uh, just the uh the that uh there is some concern about uh what's going to happen over the weekend uh just a weird 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 price action in, in vix well as we discussed before i believe it might have been at the show at at rmc but uh there <laughs> there is a lot of data coming out now that under this new administration we do have quite literal weekend risk I mean, obviously we always had it but it is a little bit more omnipresent, a little more in-your-face now under the Trump regime. Uh, they did some data out there. I forgot if it was Bloomberg or who, who it was, uh, qu quantifying the number of tweets that are coming out on that our market moving or have potential to have impact to do so. The ones that are, shall we say, a little bit more strenuous with the most exclamation points, those tend to always come out uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, it seems like. So uh, interesting stuff. So if you're, if you're concerned about weekend risk, maybe under this new era, you take advantage of those 
comparatively low volatility levels, even though the skew will get the skew in a little bit. Uh, but you can take advantage of those comparatively low levels and maybe you put away a little uh, weekend risk protection because things are popping off on the weekends these days and you don't want to be caught unawares. All right, same question to you, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, what is catching your eye this week from a volatility perspective? VIX went up and then it went down. That's what happened last week. Oh, okay. But uh, as Mar as Mark Sebastian mentioned early on Monday, uh, we we did reach intraday 2000. 17 highs on VIX. What was really interesting at that time, and when we get to the weeklies, I'll talk about a trade that took advantage of this. Um, the April standard, April futures really weren't up all that much on Monday morning. So the index was up, but the futures guys were not biting. Uh, and I think you always want to see both of them going up if, if you think it's time to get into true panic mode. So that, that was kind of a I, it might be a lesson for some of the newbies. Don't just look at VIX by itself. Take a look at what the futures are doing relative to VIX because uh, that is a little bit more of a tell than VIX just by itself. Speaking of tells, uh, we've been breaking down one of the big tells out there of late, which is, of course, SKU and all things CBOE SKU index. Been rocking and rolling a wee bit of late, and a lot of you have been hitting us up. We've been a lot of broad mainstream coverage about it as well, which is kind of interesting. A uh, subject as esoteric as SPX volatility skew uh, could get uh, some mainstream traction. That shows how far we've come in the past decade since the launch of all things VIX from a product perspective. Uh, even the mainstream press can get wrap their heads around something like volatility skew, which is always always encouraging, if also a little bit terrifying at the same time. Uh, but that said, we talked a lot about skew uh, on the last couple of shows. We had a deep dive on TWIFO last week. If you missed it, I encourage you to check that one out. We kind of went into detail. We touched on this study a little bit as well, but I thought it was worth bringing up on Volviews as well, because this is kind of our home for all things skew. And an interesting study, a lot of you write into us all the time, you know, what is the efficacy really of skew? How should I utilize this? What is this really predicting? And you know, the, the standard response to a lot of that stuff is, this is ostensibly the predictor of interest in or hedging interest against, you know, some sort of tail risk event. And uh, there's a lot that goes into that. We've mentioned that before on skew, all the different contextual things that go into that. In fact, I think we have a, a listener question along those lines a little later, so we'll get into that again. Uh, but that said, we, uh, we did an interesting study. I think this was done by oh, Pension Partners. And uh, they're looking at the, uh, all this talk about skew. Let's, let's look at the data, the hard numbers, to see exactly how much of a predictor skew actually is to these things everyone's worried about, a.k.a. the black swan or uh, the tail risk events. And they broke down skew in a variety of different ways. We'll include the link in the show notes. I encourage you to check out the, uh, the study as well. I don't have the title of the study right here for you. I'll just I tell you how to Google it directly. Uh, but effectively, what they found was that skew, even in these moments like we saw a week or two ago when it was in the upper echelon, the top 5% or so, isn't any really more of a predictor of tail risk uh, than other times when the skew is at different levels. In fact, even lower skew levels uh, is, is sometimes more of a predictor, which is kind of interesting. They have a lot of charts and graphs here uh, that go along with it. Uh, let's see. I'll see if I can break down some, some highlights. They said in every period... Uh, from one day through 12 months in their different breakdown here, uh, the worst declines following the high skew level, so it's skew in the top 5%, were actually much lower than the worst declines that followed the lowest skew level. So when the skew was at the bottom 5%, other, otherwise a time when you would think there would be very little interest or demand in hedging, therefore a little concern over tail risk. So that's an interesting uh, outlying factor. Also seeing a lot of data points here about just exactly uh, the predictability and, and use cases of this. But I thought that was pretty interesting. You don't see a lot of hard data on this because SKU, like I said, a bit of an esoteric thing to, uh, to study and quantify. Uh, the SKU index obviously makes it a little bit easier because you have some hard numbers to kind of run off with, and that's effectively what they're using to study here. Uh, but still kind of interesting stuff. This is, you know, SKU is, as you said before, is a very contextual thing, a very sometimes subjective thing as well. Uh, maybe, Russell, we'll start with you on this because you love your data. You love crunching your numbers. Uh, have you ever done any, any of your own studies on SKU? And, and what are your thoughts about uh, some of these data points or maybe just some of the perceptions of SKU out there in general? I have, and I agree with just about everything these guys are saying. Um, and what I mean by I have, I've looked into SKU and I've tried to find, you know, it, it, how well does it does how what does it do a good job as a um as a uh, tail risk indicator does it go up and then all of a sudden we have uh you know some sort of uh, 
black swan event, and it doesn't really do that good of a job, and the reason is something that we've talked about before. Uh, I'm actually going to take a little credit on how much attention SKU was getting. I put up a blog a couple weeks ago when SKU hit the all-time high, and uh, I said very briefly what they are saying in this research note, and that um, – that that the research note basically states that uh, you look at skew when it closes in the top five percent of all time closings and what the market has done afterwards versus you know the other ninety five percent of skew levels and there's really no difference it's it's very very small differences between the different types of performance uh, and and that's because skew cannot be considered in a vacuum uh, you've got to look at it in context and when VIX is low as it has been, uh, higher or elevated skew is is looking at the relative price of -of out-of-the-money puts versus very, very cheap at-the-money options. So, uh, you know, what they said where you can't really find anything after skew has been at very high levels doesn't surprise me in the vet, uh, in the least. I've tried to. What I've been doing, and I haven't come up with anything worth sharing yet, yet being the keyword, uh, is I've been trying to combine VIX with SKU to, uh, to, to, you know, I don't know, just see if there's uh, some sort of information when SKU is at a much, you know, at a fairly elevated level and VIX is above 15 or something like that and see if that has a little bit more information. You know, yeah, this is an interesting thing. I think you probably do deserve some credit for this. You know, uh, I, we've been hit up a lot on this. I know I've been sending a lot of people your way saying, hey, you want to talk SKU? Uh, talk to Russell. He's the man who has all the data. So hopefully all that has, uh, has contributed to this, this groundswell of interest in, uh, in this relatively arcane topic. Uh, but still, it is interesting stuff. I'm glad to see you have some data crunching as well. Mark, what are your thoughts on this and maybe, uh, maybe some of the misperceptions out there as well of exactly what the heck, uh, what the heck SKU is and what it's telling us? Yeah, you know, to Russell's credit, I will I will vouch for the fact that in 2012 or 2013, one of the two, he and I gave a presentation uh, in New York, and Russell talked about the fact that SKU ha- that the SKU index has surprising uh, correlation to um, kind of bad sell offs, in that when SKU is especially flat, markets tend markets tend to have their worst sell offs, and vice versa. Well. You know, I, I, one might make an argument that a, a really inexpensive skew is a better sign of a complacent market than relatively low volatility. You know, skew really represents okay, how much how do how much does it cost to hedge at the at like very cheaply? You know, if I just want to spend a little bit and get a lot of bang for my buck in the event that something really bad happens. All right. So when everyone gives up on something on the possibility that something really bad could happen. That's when typically really bad things happen. You know, Russell, I think one interesting thing that might be unique to look at as opposed to VIX in the skew index would be, what about like the VIX in the skew index? I found VIX to be VIX without any SPX. You know, if you're just looking at VIX on its own, it provides very little information other than here's how much options cost in the SPX. All right. VVIX, on the other hand, tends to give a little bit more. It, it tends to actually, I think, have a little bit of a leading effect on VIX and a little bit of a leading effect on the S&P 500. So I'd be interested to see whether an ultra-low VVIX combined with an ultra-low SKU or vice versa leads to, to anything or flip-flopped, a high VVIX with a flat SKU at X, things like that. Um, that that could combine because I, I think there that's where there's I think there's a lot more information in these secondary derivatives than there are in the first and VVIX obviously is vol of vol it's essentially a, an index on a second derivative and uh, skew index is kind of the same thing uh, you know it's a vol it's a measurement of a vol of a grouping of vol on on kind of the outskirts so maybe not quite a second derivative but certainly more esoteric. Um, so th- that's kind of my thoughts. I- I'm not shocked that the worst sell-offs are when everybody is slamming puts, because that's what caught. Because it-, it creates this need to chase gamma um, when there is a real sell-off, and-, and and I think that's why those sell-offs when skew index has been low um, can create such problems for the market. 
Um, just uh, a couple of other things. First off, I don't recall if I mentioned I actually tweeted out the link to that story. I forgot to tag uh, the two marks on that one. So maybe if uh, the uh, the Option Insider Twitter uh, Twitter handle can retweet it. That'll help everybody that's listening right now because uh, it's a great study. I, I enjoyed reading it this morning on the plane on the way over here. And, uh, it, you know, it just it, it kind of confirms all these anecdotal things that I'd seen within the market. Uh, something else that kind of confirms what Mark Sebastian just mentioned. He was talking about if you've got the protection on it, kind of uh, it, it means that people are prepared for the shock so we don't get the shock. Uh, one of the best takeaways from our risk management conference a few weeks ago was a portfolio manager that said he has been uh, hedged for a 5 to 10 percent pullback for some time. He's been doing it fairly cheaply, and knowing that he has that hedge on allows him to continue to be aggressively buying stocks. So, you know, if, if everybody's got, uh, you know, it's, it, I guess if we all had crazy homeowner's insurance where, we're, where we don't care if uh, our house, you know, gets completely destroyed, maybe we're willing to have a kegger. You know, that, that is a good point. I think we brought this up on this show, or maybe it was Option Block before, too, but it is kind of that, that difficult-to-quantify aspect of, I think he referred to as bullets, is what we always used to call it, you know, on the floor as well. You want to have some bullets in your back pocket for when, uh, for when it all breaks loose. You still have something you can fire back at the old walk-in broker when he walks in and says, how are they now? It's a nice feeling to have some of those bullets still in the chamber. And that's kind of what he was referring to uh, with that. It's also that just that, that freedom of mind to say, okay, I'm hedged, I'm protected. This strategy is, is not done, but at least it's, it's somewhat uh, capped here. I can maybe focus on some other things. There's a little bit of that mental capital you're able to allocate elsewhere to. Again, how do you quantify any of that? It's very challenging. It's very subjective, uh, but there is uh, that element to it uh, as well. So yeah, skew, <laughs> endlessly fascinating topic, endlessly controversial topic. Uh, I think maybe we'll, yeah, I think there's some questions along those lines of context uh, if we get to those, so we'll see. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting topic. I'm sure we'll, we'll debate it again in the near future. Right now, let's go on to the futures. Uh, some interesting stuff, just the evolution of the futures. A lot of that just coming from the term structure. A little bit flatter, a lot of that because the cash is popping today. Cash up. Like we said, nearly a full handle uh, this morning. So this term structure changing even overnight from last night, where you had nearly two points between the cash and about a two-month future. Now it's it's down to a little over a point, about a point and a quarter. Again, big line share of that coming from a nearly one full handle move in the cash. The future is not really moving around a lot today. So it is kind of interesting to see how that uh, how that term structure just evolves intraday sometimes and uh, even overnight as things are developing out there. Anything? Anything on the futures front, uh, Mr. Dr. Vic, soon to be, or Greasy Meatball, before we move on into all things weekly? Yeah, how, how no, about the let, Oh, Mark's oh, going. Go, Mark. I was going to say, Go. how about uh, the fact that the September future is 16 and a quarter right now? So you can go all the way out to September, which is six months from now, and buy a future that is what amounts to four handles higher. That's it and is sub 16 and a half percent that is just crazy the back end of the curve is just so cheap um shockingly cheap and um, notably september and in august in my opinion seem too cheap relative to a, a 12 vix uh I, I think that's a real problem yeah your uh, your counterpart was uh was advocating on that behalf uh, last night on Option Block as well, the SEP future in particular, uh, catching his eye out there in, uh, in Vixland. And you're right, these things are, you know, those products usually bid up by everyone in sundry. These days, perhaps not so much. Maybe it's a problem as you view it. Maybe it's also an opportunity for uh, some of our folks out there who like to get a little bit maybe longer term uh, protection, ache, or I hate to use the word, I don't like it, but hedging out there as well with some of the VIX products. Uh, the SEP future being a little bit, uh, a little bit tighter, that could work in your favor. Speaking of things working in your favor, a lot of things rocking and rolling in the weeklies. That's why we give Mr. Rhodes about 30-odd minutes or so to really break it down. So without further ado, let's get right into it. It's time for Russell's Weekly Rundown. Now, Russell's Weekly Rundown. I do love that. I still chuckle every time. We've had it for a while, yet I still it still cracks me up. Welcome to Russell's Weekly Rundown, the portion of the show, like I said, where uh, soon, someday in the near future, Dr. Vix uh, regales us with all things weekly Vix options. Mr. Rhodes, you have about 30 minutes. Go. 
a lot. Well, even though the biggest weekly option player in the world didn't do anything last week in the VIX arena, Mark Sebastian, I checked with him to make sure I wasn't going to talk about any of his trades before we got going. And he said he was pretty quiet in those. Um, however, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to work backwards on my list here. Uh, Monday, this was a, and I mentioned it in passing Monday, 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 when VIX was up around 14 or so, somebody came in and bought over uh, a little over really close to 3000 of the March 29th, 14 puts for 40 cents each. Those settled worth a buck 99 each. So, you know, back in the day, if we didn't have weeklies and you got a spike that you wanted to fade over the short term, uh, like we got on Monday, uh, you wouldn't have been able to do it. But now you can do such a thing because we have the weeklies. And as I also mentioned, the, the standard April contract wasn't up all that much. Uh, in fact, I think I mean I, I think it was up pennies relative to what was going on in VIX Monday morning. Uh, if you were trying to play that spike, you really wouldn't have had that much of an opportunity uh, because the futures didn't bite with three and a half weeks or to go until expiration. But I thought that was a really good. That's 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 the first time I've seen somebody do uh, fade one of those spikes using weeklies in size. Uh, and I bet it's not the last time we see something like that. Uh, somebody on Wednesday was selling the uh, – sold 250 of the April 5th 1150 puts for $0.15, cents, uh, just an opening transaction by itself. And then somebody on Wednesday was doing this trade, and this trade scares the absolute bejesus out of me. Uh, somebody sold as, it, it almost appears that they sold as many of the 17, 18, and 19 calls that expire on April 5th, taking in between a nickel and a dime on each of them. And these were regular trades. There might be something on the other side of them. God, I hope there is something on the other side of these. Just straight up uh, blasting that, those out. No, uh, no, not, no other leg yep. against it. Wow. Yeah, they showed up as individual transactions. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you look at the quotes every once in a while, some of those options would go zero bid to a nickel or, or whatever because you know, they, they just kept hitting them. Uh, and then somebody also has been – somebody over the course of a couple of days, two or three days, uh, has been selling the April 12th. 20 calls and taken in a dime. The open interest, I think, is around 13000 on those, and it looks like they're all naked sales. And again, I hope maybe somebody's buying the futures and selling the uh, – maybe they're buying the futures and selling options against it, uh, but that's not how it shows up on the time and sales. Uh, they did that over the course of Wednesday and Thursday. I, I, I Last I checked, which was just a half hour into the day, I didn't see many of those being, being traded today. Uh, and then somebody, this is kind of an interesting uh, backwards diagonal or backwards calendar spread. Uh, somebody uh, yesterday bought 3,000 of the May 3rd 17 calls for 50 cents, and they sold 3,000 of the June 21st 17 calls for a buck 30. Uh, might that, could that be a French election play? Maybe it's right in the middle of it. It's not, uh, it's after the first round before the second round. So uh, some interesting, oh, and then one last thing, somebody, somebody did a put stupid. Uh, they bought, uh, I forgot my size here. They bought about 2000 of the April 5th, 22 puts. This happened on Thursday, uh, paid, Nine ninety for one lot, nine sixty nine for another lot, and then they bought the same number of the April fifth twenty one puts and paid eight ninety and eight seventy two. Uh, when you put it all together, you get a break even at April fifth expiration of just under twelve twenty. So somebody uh, taking a short position on VIX, buying some deep in the money April fifth twenty one and twenty two puts. I can't remember seeing a put stupid like this in some time either if ever, in the VIX. But um, I'm a big proponent of buying uh, put options on VIX if you think it's going to drift lower. And it looks like somebody did that and decided to split between two strikes. Interesting. The strategy is getting more nuanced, more complex, and also complex, and also perhaps a little bit more terrifying out there in, in the VIX weekly options. You're right. I was just digging into those uh, 17s, 18s, and 19s. Those are on their own clearly terrifying 
Uh, obviously, we have to hope that that is against something else. Probably the futures could be a number of other things, but let's just assume for the sake of sanity that that is against something else because otherwise, uh, straight up blasting out upside, especially near term, uh, near upside like this in, in VIX is, is pretty much a, a, a road to certain ruin more so even than blasting out, let's say, out of the money puts in an SPX, something like that, where uh, you have a, a, a good chance of a decline in the near term, but uh, you have an almost certainty that there will be some spikes in VIX throughout the calendar year. So if you take this strategy and extrapolate it out uh, ad infinitum, this one is a, a quick road to ruin. So hopefully our friend got something else on, and he's just using this uh, as perhaps a little bit of a kicker, a little bit of a stop to the upside, uh, which is interesting. Also, uh, put stupids. My favorite strategy. When I say favorite, uh, I say stupids in general. I lump them all together. I think that name is quite apt. Never been a big fan. I know Mark has argued in the past about using them to adjust your delta exposure. And there is some use case for that. I will also concede what you might term the rolling stupid, where the underlying is moving aggressively. You put on one part of it, and then maybe the underlying moves aggressively your way. And for whatever reason, tax or something else, you don't want to take off that first leg, but maybe you want to add a little bit more. So that strike no longer relevant. You move to another strike, and you kind of effectively leg into a stupid that way. I can maybe understand that. But uh, initially at the outset, setting it up as a stupid not a huge fan of uh, of that trade. Speaking of trades, not a huge fan of Mr. Greasy Meatball. Are you still rocking that April twenty six fly, or is that is that off now? I, I am. I am. Uh, I I now have. I have it. I've been trying to buy more of it, and they won't sell it to me. So um, <laughs> and it, so. It's either a great problem or something <laughs> weird, or maybe well, a little bit of both. It tells you, you know. Obviously, I'm trying to get a slightly better price, but but. I think it tells you that uh, it was not an ill-advised, uh, an ill-advised trade. They, Are you trying to buy on the bid me, again? I told you before. I thought how it works. They're not giving me any deals. But I'll tell you, you know, I did spend most of the day uh, this morning, kind of on the open, trying to shut down a bunch of my um, short vol exposure. Just feels weird with the price action in VIX today. Um, I, I just don't feel. I'm not sure that the weekend risk is worth it, and. Uh, who knows? I may try and add to that that fly a little bit uh, over the next couple of days. We'll see. If they'll trade with you, if you stop trying to buy on the bid like a greedy man, pay up a penny, sir. <laughs> get uh, get up there. Stop squeezing these poor folks. They're trying to make a living, too. Uh, all right. Yeah, it has been interesting stuff. And I'm with you on that, on the uh, unknown unknowns lurking on the weekend. It seems like we're kind of the pump is primed for something weird to pop off. And uh, who knows in this environment? And we certainly are low. So VIX, if it wants to move, it certainly could move. Uh, aggressively to the upside, which our friend here selling the 17s, 18s, and 9s could discover to his detriment quite quickly. Uh, moving on to the big mothership VIX options. Another another fairly active week. Uh, you can see just in general by the fact that at ADV keeps creeping up every week, a good sign uh, that VIX is putting up some numbers these days. Remember we said before it had dropped below 600K towards the end of last year and was kind of hovering around there, even though it had been spent most of last year well above 600K. Now we're back up to that level, about 650 again. So uh, each week, that number climbing a little bit again, showing uh, that interest in and use case for VIX options continues to grow here in uh, 2017. Uh, most of the days were pretty well above that, except for yesterday, Thursday, which was about uh, 498K. The only day of the week that was below that 650. The rest pretty much at or right about it uh, for the rest of the week. And the calls, the puts, and the open interest, still not fairly heavy. We're not seeing anything uh, aggressive upside specking or hedging, not the fours, fives, sixes to ones. You see when things get a little bit uh, top heavy out there in VIX land, no, about two, 2.4, 2.5 to one. So nothing really out of the ordinary there as well, which is interesting in and of itself. Moving on to what was lighting it up, the hot VIX strikes for this week, the top 10 if you will, a number one with the bullets, uh, the ape twenties. Once again, uh, I guess I think like we said twenty five is a new thirty. Maybe twenty is the new thirty. Uh, we'll see. Uh, with about three hundred and seventy thousand contracts open for the number one spot here on our top ten list. Number two, the ape fifteens. A little bit more reasonable, a little less optimistic. About three hundred and forty seven thousand contracts open there. Very closely following on the heels, our first put on the list, the ape thirteen puts with about 346,000 contracts open. So it is still some puts playing, not just in the weeklies, uh, but in uh, the straight-up uh, monthlies here as well. Uh, the uh, Ape 18s, also uh, pretty popular. Number four, 322,000. Number, number five, 
the second put on our list, the Ape 12. So Ape 12s and 13s, those 12 and 13 strikes have been very popular. We talked about them for a while back in March. They were very popular as well. That popularity continues now into April, 309, almost 310,000 contracts open there. Number six, the bottom half of our top 10, the Ape 17, 302,000 contracts. And we drop off a bit to number seven. Uh, the Ape 23 is getting a little bit up there now. 253, about a quarter of a million contracts open out there. Number eight, the Ape 25s. About 248,000, similar, almost exact same 200 contracts difference uh, for the May 20s. So getting some May on the board. Uh, the May 20s with about the same number, about 248,000, or close to it. And rounding out our top 10 are eight 19s, 245,000 contracts open. The OI uh, dropping off a little bit after having uh, spiked up in recent weeks. I believe it hit 12. 12 and change million this these right now about nearly nine eight point nine million about six point three on the calls and about two point six million on the puts before we roll on to some other products anything else catching your eye in the uh, the mothership vix options mr rhodes or mr greasy meatball you know if i have to quote one more call spread versus put <laughs> you said that last week <laughs> You should put I that. You should put that, that in your show window. I do not want these. I am not interested. Dude, Can't you indicate what me. you want and what you don't want? Well, Can't no, because because every now and again it gets close, but the guys in the pit are just willing to. Uh, it's been slow enough that the guys in the pit are willing to basically trade those things for next to nothing. Um, and so, uh, I, I I'm really sick of those. I've seen a lot of one by twos. Um, we did see. Uh, our uh, our Morgan Stanley guy come in and buy some uh, May I think the May twenties for forty nine cents. So one thing I've noticed is and he bought this guy. You know, we there's this guy out there that buys uh, fifty fifty thousand at a clip, and I think he's a Morgan Stanley customer. Um, what he basically does is wait for some somewhere in between any time and option between seventeen and. I don't know, 22 drops below 50 cents. He buys 50,000 of them. I'm not sure what his deal is, but uh, he never pays over 50 cents and almost always pays 49 or 48. And it's almost always the 18s, 19s, and 20s, and he buys them in clips. And so he's building this massive ladder of long vol. And it's got to be against a big, long portfolio. But uh, if you want to see how institutional hedging can work in in a call buying regime watch how this guy does it he comes in buys fifty thousand electronic then a week passes the next strike is 50 cents buys fifty thousand electronic basically builds up somewhere between a quarter of a million and half a million contracts if the world blows up uh he is selling to the masses and if not uh his equity portfolio is probably doing fine um, I don't know, Russell, you've noticed that pattern, but that, that's been one of them. Th that guy in particular, he's probably the biggest or sec he's probably, I don't know if he's the biggest client, but he's one, if not the biggest, then one of the three biggest VIX trade, VIX hedgers out there. And uh, I don't know if you've seen that pattern as well, but it, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating watching how he builds a trade. Um. <clears throat> You know, the thing with that is you'll hear people talk about – you talked about it very well and very correctly, Mark. Um, you'll hear people talk about somebody buying VIX calls or how many VIX calls expired with no value or somebody that maybe sold a put and bought a call spread and VIX was so low they lost money on that short put. But the part that you rarely hear people talk about, and, and the reason that we have so much to talk about for an hour every week, is that there's another part of the story, and that is what you said. It's that most likely this guy has long a uh, you know owns uh, a lot of stocks and is hedging against some sort of uh, move to the downside, and they've lost money buying those VIX calls. But as Donald Trump has been making America great great again and stocks have been rallying they've been making money somewhere else that's always the mystery of all of these all of these vix trades is there's usually another leg hiding out there in the ether and sometimes it's hard to intuit or divine exactly what that is speaking of divining intentions that's our job now we have to figure out what the heck you're talking about because it's time to break open the volatility voicemail <laughs> It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. 
It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL. Posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the Vol Voicemail. Like the man said, this is the portion of the program where we break down what you guys want to know about in great and grand detail. By the way, I did neglect to hit the commodity ball. If you like commodity ball, tune into Twifo a little bit later today. We get into that great deal. Long story short, oil ball, a.k.a. OIV, still kind of in the doldrums after spiking a couple weeks ago, right around 28, 27 uh, right now, again, below that mid to high 30s where it spiked up to a few weeks ago, uh, back on some of those surprise numbers ever since then, hasn't been able to maintain those levels. Uh, gold right around a GVZ, aka the Gold VIX, right around a 12 or so in your old friend TY VIX. We don't talk about it a lot on the show here. Maybe we should. 4.68 uh, or so out there right now. Let's get on to some of your questions really quickly before we get that, get to our question, uh, which is uh, coming to a head Next week, I believe, which is our, our big playoff. Our tournament is dwindling down. We pitted all the various brokers against each other. What a battle it has been. Some interesting upsets along the way. Some interesting fights. Uh, I think the, the Trade King Lights being one was a really fun one to watch. That was a lot of back and forth uh, on that one. So we've had some good fights along the way. Last year's champion, Trade King, got dethroned. Some other surprises, uh, some other squeakers like Option House coming in and dethroning uh, interactive brokers and things like that. So a lot of upsets. It's been fun to watch the back and forth on this. We are down to our final two. Uh, I will allow uh, you, to, you two guys to guess if I haven't already spoiled it for you, <laughs> if you haven't looked at the show notes, uh, wh who you think our final two that will be going head-to-head -head in are in our big Broker Madness, which comes to a head, the final battle ending uh, this. Starts over the weekend, I believe, ends, I believe, on Monday. Uh, who do you think is uh, is rocking and rolling? Maybe Mark will start with you. Who do you think our final two competitors are? Well, I saw you tweeting about it. I know Lightspeed is one. And then um, I wanted to say you had uh, Options House again as the other one. Does that yeah. sound about right? Interesting. Mr. Rhodes, what are you feeling, sir? Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. <laughs> yes, old school. Very old school. Uh, unfortunately, no to both of those. That would be an interesting one if they were to make a resurgence onto our list. But it was indeed uh, Mr. Meatball. I think it was his early and often voting for Lightspeed that put them over the top. Either way, it is indeed uh, Option House versus Lightspeed. It was shaping up for a while if Lightspeed didn't pull it out that it would have been Options House versus E-Trade, which would have been an interesting showdown. And in fact, I think they were tweeting to that effect over there at E-Trade saying, oh, we, we want us to battle each other, <laughs> which of course they do. That means one of them wins at the end of the day. Uh, but that said, yeah, that showdown is kicking off. Uh, it starts today, actually. Uh, the 31st is going to be that uh, final round ending all the way through the third. So you have pretty much over the weekend. I believe it will end if my dates are correct. Yes, it will come to an end. We will reveal the winner live on our Option Block program on Monday. So tune in to see that. And by the way, you guys can vote. It is fun to vote for and or against your favorite broker. You can vote on your platform of choice. Twitter is where the main poll is, but you can vote in other places via email. You can vote via Facebook, via Stock Twitch. It's a little more laborious to do that. You have to write in and say, I want this candidate. But you can do that if you want, even though the main poll is over there on Twitter. And also worth noting that uh, you have to do something we can track in order to win fabulous prizes. So you have to retweet. We have to like. You have to do something like that because we can't, unfortunately, track who's voting. And so then if you want to win fabulous prizes, you know, the Amazon Echo and some of the cool insider gear and all the swag we get from different events and stuff. You want to access to all those cool, cool fun prizes, like, retweet, do all that fun stuff. And when it's all said and done, we'll put it all into a big hopper and we'll pick the three winners. And it will be uh, will be very fun. So look forward to that. Who knows? Maybe we'll give the winner a nice, fun, a fun uh, the broker, maybe a nice, fun plaque or trophy or something like that. We'll see. It's just always fun to pit them against each other and see who wins. You guys always have to take it from your brokers. Now's your chance to give it back. So go ahead. Vote while you still can before it expires on the third live on the Option Block program. All right. Let's get into some of your questions here. I see a lot of ones about this of late. Uh, I think this is worth I think, uh, this, I think we chatted about this topic a little bit uh, on the option block. We got another one coming in on a similar realm. This is from uh, Checker, Checker's King. Man likes his checkers. He says, uh, I see a lot of folks talking about moving averages and support and resistance levels in VIX. 
Is this kind of, uh, I think he means technical analysis, useful with VIX, or is it apples to oranges? I think I know where he's coming from. There was a, I think it was a big article, I think it was Bloomberg or something last week, writing about exa this exact thing. Uh, VIX had broken through some moving average to the upside. I think it was 200-day moving average the first time since December or something like that. And they were, they were giving this milestone a lot of credence and a lot of significance. And I'm sure people like Checkers King saw this and some of the other articles in writing. And this is the topic we've debated before, uh, you know, VIX. A lot of people like to treat VIX as this, you know, independent underlying. It's just like a stock, like an Apple or anything else that has its own kind of, uh, that, kind of that can be charted like this with fundamentals and everything else and moving averages and Bollinger Bands and support and resistance and relative strength. And I've seen all this analysis done on VIX. I've always been, if you listen to any of these shows, you know I have a bit of a, a dim view on technical analysis to begin with. I think a lot of that is maybe is, is, is self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, when you get to now doing it on a derivative of a derivative, uh, I'm far less uh, optimistic, shall we say, uh, on the outcome. You have a product that is that is is completely its own beast. It is the implied volatility of another derivative. Uh, the notion that it somehow still adheres to these technical analysis laws, I think, is uh, a little bit laughable. I don't know. You guys might uh, you guys might chime. I believe on one of the other programs, um, I think it was Uncle Mike who chimed in, and he thought it was like trying to do technical analysis on the NAV of a mu of a mutual fund. I thought that was an interesting viewpoint on it. It's a similarly abstract type of concept. Uh, removed from, derived the value from another product, not quite a derivative of a derivative, but somewhere along those same lines. Uh, but that said, this is a topic of conversation. I'm sure we'll get it again. Let's get out there, our thoughts on it now. Let's start with, uh, with you, Mr. Greasy Meatball. I, I think you're, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think you're in my camp. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not a big technical person across the board. Um, you know, you see some guys who really know, the only thing that gives me caution is I, you see some guys who really, really know options, talking about RSI a little bit, relative strength. Um, so maybe there's something there in terms of just options themselves being overbought or oversold. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, you're, you're right. It, 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 most of, the, most of that, that stuff is, is pretty dubious. Uh, if you want to know even more laughable is watch somebody try and run technical analysis on VXX or UVXY, that is just embarrassingly bad. Yeah, I have seen those too. You're right. It seems like every underlying is is equivalent in its ability to be somehow charted and graphed, regardless of what the heck that underlying actually is. Uh, I'd say, Mr. Rhodes, uh, due to your wanting to become a Dr. Vic someday, I'd say maybe of the three of us, you're probably most prone to be a pro TA, as our listener puts it. So so what are your thoughts here on the the... The uh, maybe a technical analysis first off in and of itself, and then B on its use case or perhaps lack thereof when it comes to VIX. Well, I'm I'm a big fan of technical analysis, especially for shorter term trading. Um, I don't think it applies to VIX very well, but I do think that VIX, uh, using VIX versus the futures, using VIX versus the three month version of VIX VXV, I do think there are oh, for uh, sure. there, there's some benefits in that. So I, I agree. think, and and it's funny that you mentioned that because a week from today, almost at this very moment, I will actually be speaking at the Market Technicians Association's annual um, symposium talking about all the different volatility indexes in and their use in technical analysis. Well, there we go. So <laughs> I, I, yeah, I do believe in that as well. So, But not using it with respect to, to, to VIX. I, I just don't see it working at all. I'm sure we uh, offended all those people at that conference now with our comments. I look forward to them writing in and telling us why we're wrong at great length about uh, the myriad technical analysis use cases uh, for. It's interesting you say you like it in the short term because I think that's what really beat a lot of my, my uh, interest in technical analysis out of me was when I would try to use it. And a lot, I saw a lot of people trying to use it for the similar use case on the trading floor, which is around gamma hedging and gamma scalping and trying to use every indicator you could possibly use under the sun to try to set up your gamma scalps and seeing every single one fail is kind of what pretty much broke me over time very painfully of my interest in technical analysis interesting to see you like it on the short term uh, we'll have to discuss that later Milos, let's move on to another question this is kind of i think related to what we were talking about a little bit earlier with skew and he gets to go on the show just because he has i think he has the handle of the week because comes from this comes from mustache god <laughs> Just like that. Anyone who writes in the handle like that, they get on the show. That's just my rule. All right, he says, I think, I think I'm too late, but if I pick axe and sword for the zombie apocalypse, what do I win? Uh, just kidding. Yes, you are too late. You missed that poll. I do believe 
I do believe Rifle Shotgun won that poll, even though I clearly pointed out to people who asked us, you do not have unlimited ammo. So I said, bear that in mind with your choice. They still went out and picked Rifle and Shotgun. I don't know if you have only like, a, you know, say a few belts worth of ammo for a, uh, for a shotgun, how useful it's going to be in the zombie apocalypse. I'm more in the axe sword camp as well. But hey, uh, c'est la vie. Who am I to argue with the votes of our, of our listening audience? All right, he goes on to ask his real question. He says, but if I'm looking at the end times indicator... Is there one that is better than the rest, or is it all about context and grouping multiple indicators together? Now, he's writing in about skew, because that's what that poll was. We were joking about skew, high skew, signaling the end of times, a.k.a. the zombie apocalypse. That's where that whole thing got started. Uh, so he's asking about skew in particular. Is skew better uh, than the rest in particular? You know, but this, this kind of gets back to what we were saying before and what we said so many times on the show, particularly in the volatility space. It is, it is almost impossible. I would, I would go out on a limb and say it pretty much is impossible to divorce one indicator from the context surrounding it. We talked about, how many times have we talked about just you alone on the show in the last few weeks and how many different things can impact that. Remember, it's an equation. There's a numerator and a denominator. And what happens in both of those affects the actual equation. So if it's aggressive call selling, regardless of whatever else is going on in the market, the market's just sitting there and a bunch of funds come in dumping calls. Guess what's going to happen? That skew's going to change as a result. That doesn't indicate more tail risk concern. Uh, but we're, that could, that could, in fact, that could be what happened a few weeks ago. There was a lot of call premium kind of coming in and getting dumped and calls getting a little bit more depressed than usual, hence skew higher. So these, all these things, divorce of context, really... Uh, are hard to look, let alone where the VIX is, where the SPX is, all these other levels were implied volatility, all these other things you have to kind of put into that equation. Otherwise, I think just looking at one of them, oh, skew is 160, end of the world, you know, any of the VIX is whatever, 28, end of the world, you know, any of these things in and of themselves, uh, it's kind of hard to see the, uh, the pure utility of that by itself. Uh, that said, let's go back around the horn, let's start, well, same order, Mr. Meatball, what do you have to say for our, uh, our ridiculously awesomely named mustache guy? Um, one second here. I'm sorry. I asked Russell first. <laughs> okay. You're getting caught up in all the doings going on in the suburbs of Detroit. I understand. It's a hot place to be, fun place, a lot of things going on, easily distracted. Let's move on to uh, Russell, who's in the comparatively quieter uh, <laughs> downtown New York <laughs> into Manhattan. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, what do you have to say for our friend here, wants to know, can you look at SKU or VIX or anything else kind of independently and get pure meaning is there one that's that is the leader of that or is it really all about context it's all about did you say is it all about context yes i did because that's what i was going to say yeah it's all about context i yeah I, i'm going back like i mentioned i'm doing this whole thing on how you can use um, you know, volatility indexes for for technical analysis purposes, and I actually think, and actually I know from some studies that I've done that the longer dated implied volatility uh, does lead, like VXV does lead VIX, uh, and when it's at enough of a premium, you're going to see VIX do some catch up as long as it stays there. So that relationship right there, I don't want to say that it's an end times type thing, but let's say we had the whole curve shift higher and then VXV remains higher while VIX comes in, uh, I might take that as an indication that we're not quite out of the woods yet. Yeah, you know, Russell, I did, uh, I did some analysis of just kind of looking at VIX versus VXV, and what I found is that, uh, you know, if you just look at that relationship, the two of those together, there are some, some points where when it's really high, when that spread is really high, um, that has some... Uh, predictive things on the on the market and when it the spread is especially tight that has some predictive things on the market and when it's negative so when when vix gets over vxv to a, a certain amount um there is a massive amount of of change in expectancy so i, I this was kind of random but if vix gets more than five points over vxv which does happen um it, since they listed VXV and uh, started posting VXV results in 2004, I want to say, you'd have picked up like an extra – this is off the top of my head, folks, so don't quote me on that. You'd have picked up like an extra 500 S&P 500 points. So there, there's – and it doesn't happen very often. So that that's how negatively I expect it. The other one – the other point I would say is, is as we kind of talked about, SKU index maybe has some, some use on its own. Um, but there's and maybe VVIX, but but really, you're better off just paying attention to how they're all grouped. 
Um, you always want to, you know, in the end, they're all grouped together and they're all going to looking at them in context of one another is going to make you a better trader. Yes, I didn't even bring up Vivix, another one you got to add into that contextual equation. So, yes, so much context uh, to keep looking at, Mustache God. Good questions to all of you who didn't get to them. I'm sorry. We read them all. We don't have a chance to answer them all. Sometimes we save the good ones for next week. So if you haven't, didn't get read, don't worry. Keep sending them in. We'll get to you. And meanwhile, we got to keep on rolling into our final segment. It's time for the Crystal Ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. This is why I should end the show a few minutes earlier, because I was I was leading, I was winning. The, my crystal ball pick was 12 and a half last week, by the way. This is, of course, a portion of the show where we attempt to predict what the heck is going on with VIX. I think we may actually have a tie on our hands right now, because it is exactly at 12 and a quarter, which is exactly midpoint between, I believe, Mark was uh, 12 and I was a 12 and a half. So if it ticks anyway in the next couple of seconds, we can determine a winner. I was going, oh, 12 and a, 12.24. There we go. I'll give it to Mark. <laughs> what a, this is why I need to end the show a few minutes early. I was winning the whole show, and then that one ticks. I will give it to you, sir. I will be the, I will be the bigger of the two men and allow you to have this victory. As close, as razor thin as it could literally possibly be down to, uh, down to one tick of uh, of ye old vix cash all right sir since i'll give it to you what do you got uh, what do you got for next week uh rock good old rock nothing beats rock can't beat rock uh i'm gonna go 12 good old 12 nothing beats 12 you can't beat 12 12 again huh well it worked once right so uh exactly oh i just ticked up a 12.26 if i had waited another 30 seconds <laughs> curse you curse you sebastian uh see that's what I get for being the bigger man. The bigger man always loses. All right. <laughs> let's go. Uh, let's, I was next, uh, so I don't know. Let's see. I'm going to go uh, 12 and a half is where I was. We got some weird, weird creepage, shall we say, out there in the cash, but not so much in the futures that we talked about earlier. It's, it's still kind of, uh, kind of uh, cheap all the way out to SEP, so they're not pricing a heck of a lot in, but weekends are, as always, funkalicious under this Trump regime. Uh, my 12 half was kind of... I don't want to keep my same again because Mark already did that, but I did kind of like my 12 half last week, and it was a winner until very briefly <laughs> forgot the time there. So I might, uh, this is, I don't know, I want to go a little, uh, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep 12 half. I, I don't think I've, I've done this in a long time where I keep the same pick two weeks in a row, but I'm kind of liking where I'm at. Mr. Rhodes, you were at 1280 ever. The uh, the optimist of our group, of course, you were exceeded by our guest last week, Russell from M or Russell or Ricardo from MSCI, who picked thirteen and a half. So you were not our token high guy last week. You were you were superseded. That said, where are you falling this week? I'm going to go with twelve eighty. <laughs> I think we're all three going to do the same. I think we're all either we're all lazy or we're all really liked our analysis. Uh, from last week, and not a heck of a lot has changed <laughs> from last week to this week. So we're playing it up again. Speaking of playing it, that music's going to play. There it goes. There comes the music. That means, listeners, unfortunately, we have come to the end. We had another epic journey through the world of volatility. Talked a lot about VIX options. Futures got into skew again. A uh, heady topic. Uh, I think we've finally finished that one for a while. Unless skew spikes again, we get another raft of questions on it. And then, of course, hit us up. <laughs> and then, of course, got into some more of your questions about context and volatility uh, and all sorts of other fun stuff. Keep those questions coming. Like I said, we do read them all. And by the way, don't forget to vote at Options on Twitter or uh, Options Insider on Facebook or at Options on Stock Twits. You can cast your votes on all those platforms, even though the main poll over there on Twitter. And get it done before the third. If you have, we want to pick, you want to vote for someone or against someone, go for it. Make your voice heard. Vote early, vote often. It is Chicago, after all. And then retweet and like for fabulous prizes. And before we go, let me check back in with my cohorts, my partners in crime. Let's start uh, Let's start in all things live vol. Mr. Rose, in addition to uh, talking to a bunch of chartists about VIX, <laughs> what else you got coming? And what's cooking in the land of all things live vol? Um, you know, I got to get out to San Francisco. You keep asking me that, and I haven't talked to those guys in a little while. I, I know they're working on some li they're working on more live vol enhancements, uh, but I don't know too many of the specifics. I actually, you know what? I heard a rumor that there's going to be a uh, a paper trading application that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Nice. So there. 
I did well, hear, and you, I, I did and hear you, that. And Somebody else in the Institute's working on that, not me. Well, well, and I know you can't you can't comment on this, but uh, you know, with Lightspeed being in the final the final two, um, I think mm-hmm. it's uh, interesting to point out that uh, Liveball X, the uh, professional execution platform, was sold to um, Lightspeed, uh, I believe, mm-hmm. last week or the week before. So, uh, although Sibo will maintain some management of the product, uh, that was uh, an interesting piece that that that, that, that that's all going to be uh, under one roof uh, very soon. Well, I think it was officially Sterling. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know. It's what Sterling's brand relationship yeah, with Lightspeed. Sterling, that, yeah, Sterling, that, Sterling Trader bought them. They are a uh, <clears throat> a uh, affiliate under the same uh, holding company, I believe. It's kind of what I thought. Okay, that wasn't... You never know how those how those brands break up. Yes, yes they were indeed... Not uh, a brokerage firm. Yes, they were indeed. Uh, they were indeed sold. So uh, getting a lot of little extra ink to Lightspeed, maybe helping them uh, push them ahead in our battles. Uh, so, oh, yeah, by the way, if you want to check out more about uh, LiveVol, they, of course, have that cool data shop. Check it out, datashop.cboe.com. Uh, you want to quote some bespoke data? They got you covered, datashop.cboe.com. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Gacy Meatball, what's cooking in the land of all things uh, Weekly Flies? <laughs> weekly Flies. Uh, we're going to be having our uh, webinar of the month on the 11th. Uh, you can sign up at uh, optionpit.com slash blog. I just posted a link under my trade idea of the week. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Greasy Meatball. Check them out over there, optionpit.com. Click on the blog. Click on some of their trading ideas. Maybe you take a webinar or two. Uh, who knows? Maybe you too can join the master class over there at optionpit.com to learn more. And on behalf of Mr. Greasy Meatball and someday, somehow, Dr. Vix and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing. Of course, for all of you can join us live. We love you guys, too. Keep those questions coming. We love to hear from you. And we'll see you next week for more Volatility Views. Thank you for listening to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. For episode archives and detailed show notes, please visit theoptionsinsider.com slash volatilityviews. Be sure to make your own voice heard by leaving a volatility voicemail at 773-669-4VOL or by posting a comment on theoptionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at theoptionsinsider.com, or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options, or facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider. Volatility Views is brought to you by Russell Investments, a global asset manager and one of only a few firms that offer actively managed multi-asset portfolios and services that include advice, investments, and implementation. For more information on Russell Indexes and RVX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 